Hey everybody, it's P.D. Turner, executive producer and host of The Break It Down Show. We are waiting on Todd. We're having some technical difficulties because when you have a live show, this is what you have to do. Here comes Todd. And we're having some uh, sound quality issues, and so we're trying to work on solving that. And I didn't want to be too late to get started, so I thought I'd pop in and let everybody know, hey, here we are. One thing you can always do to support The Break It Down Show is just go to that link down below. I'll put it in the uh, in the thread so you can uh, always go in. Just go to my PayPal. You can invent your own subscription. Or like, hey, I'm going to drop 20 bucks on Pete. That's the best way to do it. You don't got to watch on YouTube. Heck, you don't got to watch it all. But if you want to support, that is a great way to do it. And that frees me up to get on the road to go do things and, and everything else. Let's see if we can hear Todd. Todd, go ahead and give it a shot. I don't hear you. Aha, let me try. I'm muting here. Nope, I can't. You're muted on your end. It's all about the the patience when we have uh, these moments of, of adversity. I know Todd knows this stuff. Who knows what happens? You, know, you rely on technology when you can, and it's often so awesome. Like we're not in the same building. We can talk from a long ways away. All right. Okay, yeah. there it is. All right. And you know what? We sound great. Everything's going to be good. <laughs> let me uh, let me have you officially start the show. So I want you to, I'm going to point at you, and you're going to say this is Todd Fox, and you're watching the Break It Down show. Are you ready? I'm ready. Bam. This is Todd Fox, and you're watching the Break It Down show. You know, uh, when when things things happen all the time, it's a live show, and sometimes audio works, sometimes programs. I, did, I had to turn my computer off and on before we started because it had decided uh, I needed to – it forced me to do an update. And it's like, oh, man, you can sweat that stuff. But I think guys in our line of work who've done a lot of, of – uh, like you're trying to prevent crisis, you have to always be prepared. But sometimes the best thing to do when everything's not perfect is to really just slow down and know that we're going to get through this. And uh, and see, look, now I'm having trouble. And we're going to get through this, and we're going to be all right. But we have to um, stay calm and and go forward. You know, the timing of your battery going dead is amazing. Uh, Seriously, <laughs> it it hits the point on the head. So that's that's great. And. I think what you're saying is a, a simple fact, you know, slow it down, relax, uh, fix the problem and, and get on with it. Yeah. When, so look, I, I don't know if you know my background at all. I was a spy in combat zones. I went all over the place. I've been off, off the camp. So I've known everybody. I've known all kinds of operators and everything else. So there's a lot of uh, experience in our world and my knowledge. And when we talk about these things with like school shootings, and we're not going to get political, we're just going to talk about the tactics of it. You know, there's there's so much to master that um, I don't know that the answer is having uh, teachers uh, be armed. I, I know that what we're doing now, getting more and more secure and everything else doesn't seem to be solving the problem. But I also don't know, and this is in the tactical sense, I don't know that there's an answer for these problems because... When something bad happens, we're having this conversation because this is the worst thing that can possibly happen. But if there are, I don't know, let's say there's 150,000 campuses in the United States. And for the most part, none of them will ever have an encounter with an active assailant of any kind. And so what do you do? Like if you're running a security detail, you know, and you're trying to ensure the safety of a bunch of uh, elementary school kids, how do you how do you train for that? How do you stay aware? And people don't understand, like if your heart is beating out of your chest because something is going on and you're any way greater than 10 yards with your pistol, good in that chaos, good luck. Good luck. Yeah, I mean you're you're asking a very complicated question that we yeah. could spend we could spend years working on, but um, you know, I would probably default uh, right away to Einstein and saying that. You know, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one yeah. minute solving it. And, um, you know, we know one thing is that the uh, measures that we've taken and, and the protocols that we put in place are not working effectively. Um, where the breakdown is, we don't exactly know because it's a little bit different in every case. Um, but for sure, you know, if you break the problem down into pieces, you can solve it. Yeah. Uh, or have a higher probability of solving it than when you just throw something at it and see if it sticks. And so my initial reaction to your question is to say, well, let's start at the base. And, and I would argue that um, probably EDPs or, or uh, emotionally disturbed persons, people with, with significant mental illness are the base of it, right? Because normal people that are 
uh, functioning uh, properly cognitively don't typically go out and start shooting people and they certainly wouldn't select kids would they right. or children that are um you know undeveloped we know that we're not fully developed uh, until we're 25 years old mentally um you know they're not going to make those choices so I, I think we have to figure out what it is how do we get an early id so when people talk about the tactical word they, they talk about situational awareness right well situational awareness is all for seeing something before it happens in order to stop it and um so i think before we even get into our, our tactics specifically how do we id it what are the things that tell us what, what telegraphs it and then what do we do when we id something that has a high probability of being a problem down the road right and i, I don't know exactly you know what different schools are doing and what programs exist right now because that's not my wheelhouse but um right. that's where i would start and then i would start addressing things like I'm sure you're familiar with the federal mantra of, of run, hide, fight. Well, where am I running to? You, you tell me to run. Do I just run? Do I run to the sound of the gunfire? Do I run to a room? Do I, where, where am I running to? So like right. these general statements are great if someone defines it. Like when you're in this space, you're going here. When you're in that space, you're going there. But no. as you noted early on uh, in chaos, people just running around with their head cut off, it doesn't solve problems. So, you know, the hide and the fight, where am I hiding? How am I hiding? You know, when do I know it's okay to come out? The fighting, what am I fighting with? What weapons of opportunity do I have? So I, I think in the terms of, of the current mantras that are out there for, for school security, I think it's it's not really addressing um, the issue in the way that needs to be addressed. And we know it's not working because it hasn't worked yet, at least that I'm aware of. The, uh, the identifying the assailant ahead of time and protecting kids, the bulk of the kids from the kids that are the problem. That's a really tough thing because we don't want to do that, right? We want to include um, all kids in school. And that creates a problem because there's trade-offs for everything, right? And and so you can build a fence, you can close these kids in. And when you, I don't know if you've been to a school recently, but like literally they're, they're prisons. You know, you cannot get in, there's controlled access everywhere. And from a security point of view, that's great. And, you know, and then you teach kids what to do in response to a crisis. But at what cost? Are we are we so secure that we're teaching kids that there's threat around every corner? And I know one of the reasons why I stopped working in the world of, of intel and threat and all that, I just didn't want to live like that anymore, looking around every corner, wondering, you know, being so alert that um, I was alert to everything and therefore nothing. Yeah, I think hypervigilance, um, you know, at least the first time I heard talk of that was from Colonel Cooper. I heard it in the 80s and he had started that kind of in the 60s. Um, but you can't live in a state of hypervigilance. No one can. So you right. can only you can only pass through that for a short period of time. Um, you know, he coded colors, which is kind of silly now when you look at it because the government's done that with so many different things and it's yeah. lost meaning. But really it was uh, states of mind is what he was kind of getting <laughs> at. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so, you know, you can't live in that state. And one of the things that happens is when you're in hyper awareness, not only does it, does it break you down uh, mentally, but it breaks you down physically. And then on top of that, kids don't have the ability to, to one, sustain it. And two, the other, the other factor is that it becomes normal and when it becomes normal there's nothing special about that sense anymore right it's just it's just right. average everyday kind of feeling and you you lose your your sense of awareness about things so there's a danger in that too and i, I don't i don't have the solution to that problem because it's not my wheelhouse and i haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it but i know what's happening right now um it starts at one spot and that's mental illness and we're not able to identify and treat those people early mm -hmm. enough and mm -hmm. A major concern with not just the stigma that surrounds mental illness, but anybody sitting down and even talking to you because you feel like you've been identified and ostracized, and maybe there's a cost to solving the problem. And that cost is is you know taking people aside and saying, "Hey, I notice your behaviors change. I notice these things are going on. Can we talk? Can we can we have a conversation? You know, are you interested in in uh, you know trying to solve this problem? I I, I don't know, but." I know that what we're doing is is not the solution. Here's a good illustration of what we're talking about here. This is the actual DHS Homeland Security uh, threat color system they use. And you'll note that we are never in green or blue and probably hardly ever in yellow. We're always in a high or severe state. Maybe we're in yellow more than I'm giving account for, but that's how we view these things 
And uh, we don't know what green looks like. And if, and if you were to look at, look, and I'm not trying to say that, that kids getting shot in school is not a problem, but when you look at the amount of days of school there are in the nation and, and how safe it is, there's also diminishing returns where like you're trying to, you're trying to prevent chaos, but chaos always gets its share. It always gets its take. And, and so there's a cost. And again, so is the cost in a certain number of shootings where like, that's just how this is going to be when we do our best to prevent it. But how can you be ready in Uvalde, Texas and Parkland High School in, in Florida? You know, there's, you can't have everybody prepared for this because it's just too randomized of a threat. Meanwhile, there's real jobs that you have to do that are day-to-day -day threats. And then you also add in like the mental toll on uh, a kid as they grow up thinking like when, when we were growing up, we did uh, earthquake drills mm -hmm. in California, dive under the desk, you know, maybe once a year. We did fire drills a couple times a year, but there were never any fires. There were never any earthquakes that we had to really worry about. And so it was sort of a silly thing, you know, but there's actually school shootings and it gets it gets promoted because it gets so many clicks that I think. There's also the the cost of teaching kids that school is not a safe place. Yeah, it, it, that's been discussed kind of ad nauseum with respect to the the fire um, correlation there. And, and one of the things with that is, you know, every school does those drills. Every school has a plan for it. Every school in, in every hallway or room has a, a, a fire extinguisher. Um, these things have been going on. And, and also, you know, even if you look at systems, for example, when you look at copper versus aluminum wire, wiring's different and school codes are different. The number mm. of firefighters are different. So, you know, the the situation's kind of evolved since that that point in time when we were younger, going to school and doing these things. And, and maybe nothing happened because they had these protocols in place and right. they were addressing it. I mean, I, I would argue for what I do, for example, if I do a good job, the result is nothing. If I do a perfect yeah. job, the result's nothing. It doesn't mean that that nothing would have happened. Uh, maybe 99% right. of the time for us, nothing would happen anyway, but maybe 1% yeah. of the time, something would have happened if we wouldn't have taken those preparatory measures and, and set those things into motion. So I, I don't know with respect to that, but it certainly seems like, um, you know, we're, we're not hitting it on the head. We haven't hit a home run. And now yeah. you're talking about another thing when you mentioned Uvalde, because, you know, tactics have changed. And if we look at uh, Klebold and Harris from, from Colorado at Columbine, where this thing really started getting national attention, sure. there were a ton of indicators that led up to that. Everybody knew that these guys were doing certain things. They were saying certain things. They were threatening certain things. They were, were uh, planning for this. They had notified multiple people. Uh, they gained access to these weapons. It was not a surprise to anybody that knew them. So uh, we, we started to say, okay, you can actually build a model for this. People are talking about it. They're doing these things, behaving this way. And then it started changing tactics too, because if you look at that particular case, police were stopping and treating people medically, right? Which meant that the active shooting continued on longer than it needed to, because they were stopping rendering aid, which, which you or I or anybody would do naturally uh, through emotion. You see a, a, a wounded human and you want to provide aid to them, render aid of some sort. But the reality is that because they were standing there or sitting there or kneeling there rendering aid to someone, the shooting continued and they didn't solve the problem. So that changed. And we started saying, you know what, we're going over this person and we're going to eliminate the threat. And then we're going to come back and treat people because that's going to give a higher probability of survival. And our goal is preservation of life. So that's a better tactic. And then they started bringing in medics into tack teams, right? So now we have attack medics. So while we go and address the threat, the medic's dealing with them. He's not on the outside perimeter waiting in an ambulance to come in. He's coming in with us on the back end and, and he's addressing it. So the problem gets to the breakdowns. What happened in Uvalde where they didn't address the threat? And now, you know, we have video after the fact to look at people who are sedentary, who are not moving, who are not going in. We don't know what orders they were given. We know that the guy that, that, that initiated the movement from the border patrol didn't listen to those orders, whatever they were. Um, and that solved the problem. So, uh, you know, I, I think we're moving in a general direction forward, but everybody's not on the same sheet of music. And if I go to a training on a state level or a local level, it's very different than if I go to say Fletzy. And when I get to Fletzy, mm -hmm. there, there's this active shooter program, but at the state side, they had a totally different approach to it and, and it's not streamlined. And then you get, you know, I don't know that chief of police, so I, I can't speak to him, but it seems like from the limited information I have, um, he made some very bad decisions 
and he didn't have a tactical background. And so, sure. you know, when you start to consider those things, is there a minimum tactical proficiency for someone in the command staff, at least in understanding, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, it, it's uh, it really is such a complex problem. I'm looking at the history of uh, school shooting because you know uh, my my school when I was a kid in '87, we had a uh, actually it was '86, we had a a dude from who graduated the year before walk onto the campus and he murdered his girlfriend. Could have been could have been uh, accidental homicide, but um, you know we'll never know. And and that's that's a school shooting technically. Could that have been prevented by a bunch of locked gates? I think. Yeah, probably. But but that's uh, that's the nature of school shootings is that they're all different. And the planner, as you know, the planner has all the advantage, and so you can you can look for how you want to do something and dream it up and and really you yeah. know just so, feed into your own psychosis, you know, and just go crazy with that. Absolutely. So so I'll break it down very simply for you. When you talk about this and, and you started this, I'm just going to break it down in simple terms. The shooter, the active shooter, the aggressor, whoever that is, is picking the time, they're picking the location, and they're picking the method of attack. The only yeah. thing that is left is the response to that. So now we're talking about they're picking 75% of the equation, which are the acting portions. And then the first responders are the people in the immediate area are behind the power curve because you're talking about action versus reaction. Mm -hmm. That's never a good spot to be in. And while you talk about layers like concentric rings of security around something, those things can be engineered. Just like your, your lock at home, whatever system you use can be breached pretty easily by someone that's trained. Yeah. Um, it's not designed to stop people completely. What it's designed to do is slow down the attack. The more layers that you have, the slower or longer it takes them. And, and theoretically, as you get into those concentric rings, right, you're trying to delay, you're trying to, even before it happens, you're trying to deter people with good lighting, with cameras, with those fences, maybe with, with dogs or whatever you have. Um, you know, you're trying to deter them, then you're trying to delay them, then you're trying to basically figure out where they're at by detecting them, and then you're trying to mitigate it. So yeah. you know, it, the, the systems um, are, are complex in themselves, and the more that you have a complex system, the more robust it is, the more money it costs to operate and maintain. Oh and it's by people who don't want to give money to that particular thing. Yeah. So uh, that is a challenge in and of itself in, at the level of execution. Yeah, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up because um, I would say if I was going to provide a one size fits all solution, I would take, uh, you know, dudes that like, I don't want to be a SEAL anymore, or I don't want to be Marine recon guy anymore. And let's hire that person for 150 grand a year. And they'll have a carbine and they'll just be a bad motherfucker. And if you come to this campus, you know, there's a bad motherfucker waiting and the community shares the cost of that. But that's that is a $5 million solution. And these dudes do this in like, in, look, you're in martial arts, you know, like you, you were going to bust a tendon or a, an arm or a something. If you're maintaining your tactical proficiency, it's something as challenging as this. It's just, you're going to have a percentage of your workforce. You have to pay them to be home, resting, recuperating, recovering. But even that doesn't prevent that. <laughs> like it's just, because no. there's the other problem of, um, and we're seeing like this video of this kid who's stomping the heck out of out of a teacher, and there's there's authorities standing by as it happens because they're afraid to act because they're of their afraid own to act because of of a lot of social factors. If you exactly. talk to them after the fact, they will explain, "Hey, I noticed this, but this person was that, and this other person was this, and I didn't uh -huh. want to lose my job, and I was concerned because I have to feed my family, and yep. I don't want to be canceled, I don't want to be fired, or thrown in prison." <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, that the, the incident that you're referring to from last week, that's a common occurrence. That is a common occurrence. If you talk to school teachers who are open, who are honest, who are telling you about what's happening, it's all the time. Yeah. When you embolden that mindset in, in, you know, I'll just call it criminal behavior, even if it's in children, you know, why would you not expect to see it continue or rise? It, it doesn't make sense. You know, mm -hmm. so we're, um, we're, basically tying our own hands with this. And, and I'm talking right. about not me and you, but society. Yeah, 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 right, right, cool. yeah. Well, just the, like the Parkland shooting, the dude who's outside, you see the aerial shot of the sheriff's deputy. I'm looking at that and I'm going, yeah, that's a dude that doesn't have trust in his command and hasn't been unable to run into that school, you know? And it's one thing to teach someone and train that response of running towards contact, but it's another thing to have them believe that they're going to go make, look, you can't, 
the moment you run towards content, you're making decisions. A lot of them are not going to be correct. And bad things can happen in a, in a chaotic situation like that. You have to know that, like, hey, we expect you to do your best, you know, and that's it. Um, yeah. We'll sort and, the rest of that later. Our, our society doesn't do well with that because what you're referencing is called Hicks Law. And Hicks Law right. states that basically the more options that you have, the less likely you are to pick the correct option. So mm. too many things going on. So in, in terms of cops, if you think about I have a pistol, I have magazines, I have OC spray, I have a baton, I have a taser, I, I have all this crap on me. And I have one second to make a decision that's oh. life for me or that person or the rest of the community. And now I have to cycle through the decision making process. That mm. process. I have to have some type of recognition prime decision making. I have to have some reference for it in my head. I have to have that yeah. synapse between neurons so that that speeds up, right? And that, yeah. that's something that Gary Klein talked about ad nauseum. He 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 wrote multiple books on it, and uh, a lot of different people picked up on it. But we're we're not picking things up quick enough. We're not able to respond quick enough. We're we're stalling or delaying because there's a concern of of the repercussion to my action. Like, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do the wrong thing. And in that moment, to be quite frank, there's not a lot of time to think through options. You don't have that amount of time. You need to act. Mm. And that needs to be trained into you at a visceral level. And the only way to do that is through stress. And it's through repeated training over and over. And guess what? That means exposure. And so you know mm -hmm. to here. Well, guess what? That's, that's the cost of doing business. It's and in the process too, you know, we're going to have human error. It's going to happen. It happens with doctors. 250,000 people a year get killed, uh, you know, from some type of malpractice from doctors. And we accept that. Yeah. We're going to have to accept it on other fronts as well. And and I'm not trying to be harsh or hardcore about sure, it. Sure. Sure. In terms of, of reality. Well, and again, that's like when I talk about the instance of a school shooting, they really statistically, they're not reliably to stopped. And it's just, it's too random. And, and if not that, it'll be, it'll be something else because that's just the target right now. Uh, you really can't reliably do that. That stress testing you're talking about is huge too. You can have all the decision matrix and PowerPoint slides with the arrows and everything going on it. But until you put someone in stressful situations, which is in effect mentally breaking them in a lot of cases, right? To, to withstand that training over 20 years, you're going to cause some, some, some mental problems. But if you put a person through that thing, then okay, you've trained them to respond accordingly. But if you don't, if your school resource officer is just the dude who's like, you got back from maternity leave, I want to take an easier job. Like that's not that true. That's not that job. That's a different job. So that will, so I went camping up about a mile up um, the Eastern Sierra, and um, look, and I'm I'm pretty capable with a pistol, right? And so uh, I ran about 25 yards away. I did 10 push-ups. This is at altitude, so it's like 9,000 feet, and then I ran back. And I only ran. I just like lightly jogged, and I picked up my pistol. And then a, a person called out targets, and I tried to shoot them. Bam, bam, bam. You know, and I didn't like to spend a lot of time aiming, but I tried to be a little deliberate with the shooting. And uh, it is very 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 hard to have your body that keyed up my heart was beating really hard because there's no oxygen up there and just that physical stress test like i would challenge anybody who goes out and shoots like uh you know a three gun or anything or just with your friends walk in place and try to hit a target reliably it's really really hard when you add stress into the physical aspect and now the mental aspect if you're not training those two things together and there's probably a third aspect yeah, you when you the, the things you're talking about, you're talking about several different things. Like when you mentioned SRO, right? Um, the school resource officer typically, as you noted, is transitioning out. And he also has to have the demeanor to work around and with kids. And yeah. that's not something that that is always there with all officers, right? And so now selecting that guy who wants to do the job, because if you have a hard charger, chances are he's not going to want to be in a school all day with a bunch of kids. That's the truth. So now you got to find a guy. But also you want to make sure that that person's not in retirement mode and they're retired on the job. That's a huge problem. Another thing happened to me last week that, that speaks to what you were talking about, which is I was doing a Stop the Bleed course and we're dealing with tourniquets and we're dealing with chest seals and we're dealing with Israeli bandages and we're dealing with quick clot. And one of the guys in the class was a professional fighter. And he was going to be assigned this task to deal with these specific things in this particular realm that we were working in. As I'm talking about what's going to happen with a compound fracture and talking about the bleeding and talking about these different components, he started kind of making a funny face. He started getting flushed and he passed out. 
So just the thought of that, basal vasal is, is what occurred. So he basically thought about the, oh my God, it was traumatizing me and he passed out. Now, do I want that guy being the guy that I assigned to that duty, knowing that just the thought of it puts him to sleep? I don't want that. I want a guy who can see it. There's blood all over everything and they're dealing. They're going hands on. They're bloody. The person's bloody and they're putting pain on them. When they put that tourniquet on, the person's screaming for them to take it off. They don't give a shit and they're, they're putting it on. So there's that. And the thing that you mentioned, I agree 100% with when you talk about pressure testing and stress, you know, like me and you, if we go out and we run around um, our heart rate goes up incrementally, even if it's fast, it goes up incrementally. But when you have an adrenal response, the hormonal heart rate kicks in and hormonal heart rate is significantly different because you may be walking around at 60 beats a minute and now you're mm -hmm. 180 to 220, 230. So that happens instantaneously. It's just like if somebody hits you instantaneously versus you know they're coming and slowly they're walking at you. And, and so people managing that, obviously once the heart rate goes up to that level, you're sucking wind, right? So now you can't get enough oxygen. Your lungs aren't working the same way. Your heart output's going crazy. You know, mm -hmm. you have this restriction, right? You have tunnel vision. You have a lot of fine motor skills in your fingers. You have auditory exclusion. All of the blood pools to the center of your chest. You can't use your limbs the same way anymore. And all of that's, that's hardwired for survival. The problem is when we put people into these conditions and expect them to take those factors and just be able to, to work with them without pressure testing them, it fails every yeah. time. Every time. Yeah. There's a, uh, you never can find it anymore. Who knows why? But uh, there was a, a thing where there was a parent who was very anti-gun and, and, and anti, you know, anti-police. Like you could probably put a character in your head. And she came in to do like a series of, of action shooting, you know, just to like get an idea of what it was like. And in the scenario, they could put a face on the thing that you're shooting at. And so she ended up shooting her daughter in this thing. And she's like, I had no idea how hard it was. And this is, you know, this is standing in a room, bang. Bang. You know, and you're not, I don't even know if they use real guns for this, but when you're trying to sort this stuff out in real time, and, and again, if you've had the training and if you've been in combat long enough that combat slows down, you understand like you're doing things automatically. I can slow part of my brain down and go, breathe in and out long, slow breaths. And so it sounds like I'm out of breath, but really what I'm doing is I'm just, you know, and I'm breathing to try to control as much as I can my physical response. And I know to go slower and I know to, you know, just like to, you can slow these things down, but it takes access to very, very, very stressful things. And if you imagine, I mean, oh my gosh, like you, you do security for a living. So if there were two assailants or even a sound that could have been like a door slamming, you know, you're like, oh, that's a whole new thing. And your brain is trying to sort through all of these impossible scenarios and, you want to move so fast. But again, like from the start of the show, a lot of what you have to do is force yourself to slow down. Use that adrenaline to your advantage, but don't let it take over your entire well-being and your entire response physically. Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is conditioning people and being accustomed to how things work. And whether being in the Marine Corps or being on a SWAT team or being a professional fighter, all of those realms – I've been in situations where you have anxiety, you have nerves, you have dreams, <clears throat> but it's very different when you know it's coming. When you know it's yeah. coming, it's about to happen. And then I have the tools to manage it from past experience. My chance of, of doing well in that realm is very high. Right. And it's trained into you, just like anything else. The idea that you'd expect to do good in that kind of realm with that level of intensity, it doesn't make sense. It's like showing somebody a book on on you know open heart surgery and then just throwing them into the operating room like go 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 like it, it, it doesn't work right it yeah doesn't, no one would expect i mean you laugh i laugh when some of the yeah. like that but that is the equivalent right we talk about these things but the, the truth is you know when we look at um you know low frequency high risk events yeah they don't put a lot of weight on those things because they don't happen that much so we don't train for it that much. And there's only so much money and so many hours for training. And the truth is, like, if we're talking about police, for example, they're not going to spend their own money to go out and get the training they need. And their yeah. agency is not going to give them enough of what they need because they don't have the time and money to do it. So, you know, this gets back to, to being reliant yourself as, as a parent or a family member or a community member where you get the training you need to, to create the results that, that you're after as a, as a human, as a citizen. 
I love that you brought that up. And I want to get into that because, uh, you know, one of the things my girlfriend and I kind of have this joke, you know, we're Orange County first team, first responders. We respond first. The first response, we always look at, and I love my firefighters and, and everybody who it was in that line of work, but they're rarely the first person there. You know, the first aid is self aid. And you're just talking about that. The next aid is your buddy aid, you know, the person who shows up. So if there's someone in an accident, I get out of my car and I run towards that accident because I know to respond, right? That's been trained in. But that's, you know, that's a capacity we can all develop. You know, like, what do you have in your car? I, I don't have an IV bag. But I probably don't need one. One of those is coming. But I do have whatever, you know, something that I can uh, render aid with, whether it's a, gosh, and you say Israeli bandage. And I'm like, oh, boy, now we're all going to get in trouble for calling an Israeli bandage. <laughs> it's like <laughs> the instant compression bandage, whatever it's, whatever it's going to be. Yeah. But what are some of the things you can do? Like, what are courses you can take? How does someone make themselves resilient to um like right now in southern california you know there's trees falling out of you know out of the ground <laughs> there's 10 feet of snow everywhere people are having to scramble because you're, they uh they don't have the point. normal things you know that's you're on point with all of that and, and oddly enough just by coincidence this afternoon i spoke to a group of college students in costa mesa um, about these subjects and and it's it's on you it's on you to get the training get the results you know, you ask, what can you do? In my personal opinion, is that you do something difficult and stressful and challenging and something where you're forced to constantly struggle and be uncomfortable. And yeah. my suggestion to an average everyday person is jujitsu. Do jujitsu because you're going to find you'll never master it. It's always going to be a struggle. You're always getting better. You're always getting tougher. You're getting physical fitness. You're getting camaraderie and you're learning skills that are applicable in the real world. So do something like that is my number one suggestion. Number two, I would say is do a TAC med course, a, a TCCC kind of course. Um, and, and you can find them two day, three day courses where you learn, you know, the basic stuff. You don't need to be a trauma surgeon and you also don't need to, to get training right. to put a band aid on somebody. So I don't, I'm not worried about a band aid. I'm not worried about some minor thing. Um, I'm worried about something in the middle because I need to stabilize them until I can get them to a higher level of care. That's what saves lives. So that, and I think that's readily available to the public now since all the war fighters have come home for the most part. So yeah. that's one, two. Now three is, going to be driving because every one of us drives all day, every day, you know, we're going to, yeah. we're going to in America, that's a reality short of something like New York city where, where most people don't drive. Um, and you know, LA where I lived for many, many years, you know, I would commute from the city to Santa Monica and back and that, you know, let's say in a normal condition that would take like an hour and a half versus in other, any other city be like a 20 minute drive. Right. Yeah. That means I've got that much exposure in the morning and at night. And with the traffic on the 10 or the 405 or wherever you're at, you know, you you are likely to have problems. And if you have the skill set to save people, what better gift is there? So if you can fight, if you can drive, if you can medically take care of people, you know, I would go as far as saying, you know, there are certain courses out there. And I'm sure they're also in, in L.A. The courses that I did in the military and law enforcement were on the East Coast. But like uh, Vehicle Dynamic Institute or BSR. BSR has really good training. Um, actually, they're uh, they're on the same side as the State Department out there and uh, a bunch of other things that you can go out there and you can take if you if you clear a background check, you can take a course like a three day or five day uh, like evasive course. So not only do you not get in an accident, but you know how the vehicle works to use it as a tool in many different ways. So to prevent something, but also to use it if you have to as a weapon. Um, and it's day in, day out kind of stuff. That coupled with medical skills and hand-to-hand and -hand type skills that make you mentally tough, it's hard to beat that. Hard to beat that. And, and uh, a huge multiplier if something happens. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about your professional work when you're when you're like and, and you click on your link tree. Everybody go to Todd's link tree. It's right down there. It's link linktree.ee, and then it says tour protection. Um, you're dealing with people that are. They're putting the fan in fanatic. People love Tommy Lee or whoever it's going to be that you're standing in front of. And they're desperate to get close to them. It's their one shot and they're desperate. And they're going to act like a person who does not have good intention. you know. But all they really want to do is just come up and get a selfie and say hi and maybe have their one shot at, at saying hello and getting a kiss or something. How do you sort that out? How do you allow that fan 
to be that? How do you allow Tommy or whoever your client is going to be one direction? How do you allow them to be great at working with their fans, but also keep them safe? That seems impossible to me. It, it's a daunting task and it never ends, but let me give you two simple ideas. One is through advancing and walkthroughs. So putting barricades in place, putting security in place, having these layers of security, one, uh, and that's all choreography. That's done well ahead of time. I know the layout of wherever they're gonna be and how it's gonna function and what security I have and what my budget is and what I'm gonna have for medics and police and everything else. That's one component. But the bigger component, and, and probably most people watching can do this, and maybe they already do, is establishing what is normal in an environment Okay, so any given environment has a different baseline of normalcy. Once I establish the baseline of normalcy, then I can detect anomalies, things that are abnormal that wouldn't normally occur in that environment. Once I detect an anomaly, okay, and an anomaly can be an addition to wow. what would normally occur or a removal of something that should be there that's no longer there. So you can have a, an anomaly above the baseline of normalcy or an anomaly below the baseline of normalcy. Once you figure that out, you have to decide, is that a critical anomaly or is it a benign anomaly? Right. And if I'm going through this, and I think, you know what, that may be a critical anomaly. I have to err on the side of caution. So I, I either continue as planned with, you know, hyper awareness on that particular issue, or I change, I deviate from our protocols and do something, or I cancel it altogether and remove them. So I'm going to either continue change or cancel. So baseline anomaly is, is something that is really valuable for people. Mm. The, the first part being the most valuable, which What's normal? What's normal for a rock show, for a hip hop show, for a country show? What's normal for people who see somebody who they love and admire? What's their behavior like? What are their mannerisms like? Um, these things help me determine what doesn't fit into the environment. Mm. And so if I'm talking about it in broad strokes and using generic cliches, I would say like it's 90 degrees outside and that guy's got a black trench coat on, right? Like sure. Something yeah. that doesn't fit. Now, maybe he's just a crazy dude, or maybe he just likes that look, or he wants to be different, or he wants attention. I, I don't know. I would have to investigate further. But there's smaller, nuanced things that don't stand out quite mm. like that, right? Where their eyes are going, how their hands are moving, how they're positioning themselves, how they're pacing us in a movement. You know, what's what's on their waistline, right? Because hands kill, but people will typically look at things. People will touch certain things. I'll feel to make sure that gun's still there, right? I'll be looking what I'm going to target and then I'll look back at what I have to target it. So there are all kinds of things that we do that yeah. it's very hard unless you train, it's very hard to get that out of your system as a human. Yeah. And so if you can identify these things early on, then you know to put your attention there or to take one of your guys off the detail and put his attention. There. So it's, it's methods like that that really help us kind of um, stay in tune with what's happening and be able to address these problems before they get nasty. When, you, when you're on a combat patrol, you know, my job is to talk to people, right? That's what spies do. And so I have to be calm enough to have a happy face. I got to be talk to a bull. But when I'm not in the talking business, I'm observing. And I have, uh, I hope, sometimes it might get out, out of my mouth, but I hope I have an internal monologue. And I'm like, I can see that guy's hands. That guy's waving like this. And I'm just patterning behavior, right? By just cycling it through another part of my brain by, by repeating like, you know, that guy has a white beard, he has this, whatever it is. And, and I'm not doing it as a threat thing. It's just an overall awareness thing so that when I go back, I can pull that memory or I can understand like a pattern. Like when, when you wave to, to children in Iraq, you have to move your hand. But you don't do that to dudes. You go like that to dudes. I learned that by watching people over and over and over again. And I, I patterned that behavior. So when you're talking about that, it's possible to to you know eliminate some of the unknown by just simply watching what fans of this artist do you know how they and you know, there might have been some kind of video that was produced that causes them to make a hand gesture you know like oh that's because of you know i will rock video number two or whatever it is but there's there's all these things right like these auto mnemonic things that you can do to make your brain respond but there's also those things that stand out and you can't put them down. And I'll give you an example. Here's what happened to me today. I was, I was in court for jury duty and I'm in the jury box waiting to see if I'm going to get selected. And directly across from me on the other wall is a projection of a, a mouse icon, you know, like the arrow. You guys can you picture the arrow, you know, that would be moved around. And it's just sitting there. And I'm like, 
that's not supposed to be there. And my brain would not let it go because that does not belong on the wall right now because we're not doing presentations. And why is that on the way? And so my brain had fixed, fixated on it. And because it's stupid, you know, jury duty, I guess sit there, I could let my brain play with that whole thing. But there are certain things that will stand out if you notice them. And I can promise almost nobody else noticed that arrow, even though they were sitting there for hours and hours. But for me, I see it and my brain fixates on it. And then I've got to decide, is this something to worry about? Yeah. So the one of the things that, that happens a lot in our business is um, related to the, the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon, right? So if, if you um, think about something or you talk about something and you had never talked about it or looked for it or, or thought about it before, but then you go out in the world, all of a sudden, everywhere you go, you start seeing that thing because your attention's there. And once you put your attention there, it's hard to take it off, right? Because all of a sudden, you know, you and I were talking about buying a you know, a, a Chevy truck and I right. see the truck everywhere I go now and I never saw it before, but it wasn't that it didn't exist before. It's just that my mind wasn't focused on yeah. it. And that's an issue with, with some of the stuff we, we do. Like if you're looking for the right things, you're conditioning your mind to search for those things. And you mentioned another thing that's really pertinent mm. to the job. Um, you know, when we go into these different cultures, they have dif different customs and courtesies and different behaviors. And, you know, for example, you're, you're talking about the Arab culture. You know, I in America, I could go up to a woman and start talking to her and interacting with her with her husband sitting right there. Right. And it would be OK. It wouldn't be an issue. Uh, I could go up to, to them and I could touch them, you know, on their back with my left hand and that would be OK. Um, those kinds of things don't exist in America, but they do in other countries. And so being yeah. cognizant of that and even regionally. So let's say I'm in the north of Iraq and I'm dealing with the Peshmerga, right? They operate in a very different way. They, they sure. think in a different way. They function in a different way. So knowing my area of operation where I'm at. Um, you know, how people behave in South Africa may be different in, in throughout South Africa. Joburg is, is, you know, one animal, or I can go to the north of Africa on the same continent and they're behaving completely different. In one place, I'm doing something respectful and the other place it's disrespectful. So that's a big part of our job, seeing, learning, absorbing, and then applying. It's, it's, it's everything. It's life or death, you know, and building relationships, as you know, is it's critical to survive. Yeah. It's funny. I did a show with, um, uh, now I can't think of his name. He's the seal who did the 100 things list. Um, what is his name? I can't think of what his name is, but it's a really successful book. And it's like the hundred things you do. And it's like, you look in the mirror before you go and you make sure you have this and you make sure you have that. And we did a show together and he talked about his approach to a given situation. And then I talked about mine because we have different approaches to these things. You know, like there's things we agree on. Like if you sense danger, create distance. Like don't like, don't get into a fight is the best fight of all. Like I've already won. I am no longer in that fight. It's the only, it's the only way to win. Period. <laughs> I swear to God. Yeah. And so you look at these, th there's often a multiple ways to do it. Like if there's a mounted cop or if there is a, like, so I'm going into the courthouse and the last sheriff's deputy I walk by as I'm going in, I look at that guy and I say, Hey man, I think, I think, thank you for being there and keeping us safe. You and your team are doing a great job. That might not be anything to anybody, but to me, that's just a little chip of good favor. If something does happen and that guy recognizes me, he, maybe he doesn't shoot me that day, you know, out, out of fear or whatever it is. Maybe he sees me when he needs, I don't know, who knows, right? But it's, that's part of like the spy approach is like, how do I make myself present and known? So if I make eye contact with somebody, there's some extra communication there. And this is little things like that that make a difference, but it's, um, it requires you not to be on your phone all the time. It requires you to take extra time to be in places, to maybe look around a little bit more. And again, not hypervigilance, but trying to just be more aware and more present in the situation that you're in. Like I, I know where they, I used to, I've gotten away from this because it's just too maddening. I used to know how many people were in the room. Well, no matter how many people were in the room, I could, I can estimate probably pretty reliably up to 500 people in a room and you know, once you get to 500 who cares right it's a lot of people but i could look in like a sizzler if i go in there and i'm like there are 45 people in here and i'd be within five people of that number so you can develop these capacities but does the average mom and dad do they need to do that do you think i think it pays dividends across time so maybe not immediately it doesn't mean anything but over the course of a lifetime doing these little things that, that really don't take that much time or energy they will produce a result. Um, in my realm, we have a lot of downtime. So, 
you know, I don't know how much time you spend around the military, but hurry up and wait is the norm. Yeah. So we have the same thing. So what do I do? I start to play games in my head. Okay. What if somebody came out of that door? What could I do? Where could I put them? What if it was X level or Y level of threat? You know, what would, what would be tolerable for me in terms of use of force? Right. You know, what if they came through that window? What if they came over there? I've got time to use and I can either right. use it conditioning myself or I can plan a phone and be disconnected from the entire realm and be negligent in what I'm doing. Um, so, so I think training your brain is, is a great thing because we're used to staring at these guys and, and when we stare yeah. at the phone, we're not thinking. And, and you know, it, it's, it's something that uh, is an attention suck. And when it sucks your attention in, you lose it in all these other realms. And, and I'm guilty too, just, just to be clear, oh, you know, I have to yeah. work myself out of that on a regular basis saying, whoa, whoa, put it down, do this task. And when you get to a space that's safe and you're in your hotel room or you're in a bathroom or you're somewhere else where it's a controlled space, now look at it, but don't, don't look at it while you're driving. Don't look at it while you're walking. Don't, and that's not the norm anymore in our culture. You know, everybody's yeah. constantly connected to their phone with their eyes and ears. Yeah, boy. I, I mean, I'm listening to audio. If I'm walking, I'm probably listening to an audio book. You know, like it's just it's just how we do it. And you're right. It, it is tough. It's tough to be aware enough because a lot of times the survival of the thing is just being the first one to act and get out of that situation. You know, like they talk about surviving. If you survive the crash of the plane, the people that die are they're still stuck on the airplane, and not because they're it's crowded, but because they're unsure of what to do. You know, and like get off the plane or whatever that thing is going to be but you know in the courthouse in orange county i think it's like 10 floors if there is a fire alarm you need to get the hell out of that building <laughs> just and don't dawdle about it the um 9 11 you know when that happens there's this guy rick uh, rick corsola who's a vietnam vet he was he's one of the guys and we were soldiers once and the last time anybody saw him after he evacuated his entire crew because he acted quickly was him going back up to go get more people out that didn't belong to him you know, and because he knew threat, he understood what was going on. He knew he was there in 93 when the uh, first attack had happened. And he's like, we're always going to be prepared. I'm going to make you do fire drills. We are going to go down these stairs often enough. You guys know what to do automatically. If there's trouble, get the hell out of the building. Mm -hmm. And and he saved a lot of lives by doing that. And and I guess that's that's ultimately what we're talking about. But you know what? I, I, I don't. I don't want to stay in all this. this no, I mean, I, you're 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 speaking to uh, you know a cognitive bias, um, you know, toward normalcy that everything's always going to be the same and it's not going to yeah. change. And that's not the reality of life. It's in a constant state of change, and we just expect it, right? Like, yeah, you no, know, it's going to be normal. Um, you know, it's September 10th. Planes don't fly into buildings and whatever. So yeah. you're not prepared for it to happen, and your brain can't process it. So if I took this computer and threw it on the ground. I wouldn't expect it to behave normally anymore. I know that, that the software is damaged, the hardware is damaged. And that, that's what happens in these emergencies is you, you have, even if it's TBI, you have yeah. this injury, this thing that happens to your central processing unit, right? And then even where that normally processes, like it's prefrontal cortex, all of a sudden going to the amygdala. Yeah. And it's, you, if you expect it to operate the same, you, you're just disconnected from reality. Yeah. So unless yeah. you're training it, unless you're preparing and unless you're doing that for a long period of time, it's just it's not going to be that way. So I think all those points are valid. And I think as a society, we're going to pay the price for it. We have things to gain and we have things to lose. And that's where analysis comes into play. And then thankfully, at least at this point in time, we're still free to make certain choices. And so if you you know, value one thing over the other, you can live your life in that way. And I don't know how long that will continue for, but uh hopefully for a while and, and we can live our lives accordingly. But uh, I certainly am, am trying to distance myself from this guy more and more yeah. as time goes on. Boy, I'd say, well, you know, and we're basically the same age. I'm, I'm 53 mm -hmm. and we remember a time when, well, how about this? I remember a time when I would tell my parents, I'm going down to the school to play football mm -hmm. and um, I'd be gone for hours. And they couldn't look in on me. I mean, they could drive down to the school and they would just see me running around playing football, but they didn't have the ability to pick up. Where's my phone? It's not here because I'm good. You know, pick up their, their phone and this, we'll say it's a phone. Pick up their phone and go, what's my kid doing in the house? And they can look at it and have constant surveillance on their kid. Oh my, oh my God. You know, we don't have to have that much connectivity to something. And we're giving up things um, that we probably should keep. But I don't know, maybe that's just me being an old man. What do you think? 
I don't think it's you being on I think if you know better, right? Like if you've been in the world where we didn't have that stuff and you're in the world where we have it, you can make a decision. But if you've never been in the world where we didn't have that, you can't really make a decision, right? Not an informed mm -hmm. decision. Mm -hmm. If all I've had for for you know food is McDonald's, and then I have this this chef, this this culinary celebrity who's amazing, who has this organic food that's sourced locally, and he just prepared it amazing. I've never had that, so I can't say that that sucks. Yeah. Right? My my default is McDonald's because that's all I've ever had, and and the same thing exists here. You know, there are people now. I was I was teaching a class last night. And a guy was talking about, well, I just would look at this on YouTube or I would just do this. I'm like, that didn't exist before. We didn't have it. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have emails. I couldn't, you know, go around from place to place because everything wasn't readily available. And yeah. I, I think there are pros and cons of that, you know, to check on places. That's great. But also now people are breaking into those networks so they can see the same thing you can see when they're getting in that network. So, you know, that. Uh, that would be why I would maybe on the outside have wireless devices, but on the inside have them hardwired so that people yeah. can see what's going on inside. So all those things, there's there's pros and cons, I think, to everything. But I also think it has a lot to do with how you see the world. Um, and, and I'll give you a 30-second kind of idea. For me, when Please. I was young, I wanted to be where the action was. You know, as a young guy, I always wanted to be in the action where it was at. So I was in the city. I lived in the city, a lot of people, a lot of activity, a lot of nightlife. Um, you know, I traveled around and I wanted to do the crazy stuff in the Marine Corps. I want to do the crazy stuff on the SWAT team. But as I get older and I have more experiences and I change and I see things through different lenses, um, it, it's important for me to move away from the city, to be in the yeah. country, on land, to, to have a, a more rural setting, to be able to have freedom, you know, clean air, to be able to, to move about freely without people kind of constricting my movement or watching every uh, thing that I do, um, you know, to be more in touch with, with nature and how things naturally things naturally work, you know, to be able to grow food, to be able to yeah. manage animals. So those things change for most people as they age and as they see life differently because they have experiences to look back on. And also when you have those experiences, you can look forward into the future and say, I see trending, I see this trend occurring, and therefore I might want to make these decisions to put myself in a different spot. Now, I don't want you to reveal any specific methods because um, there's things that, you know, should belong to you and, and not, not to us. But one of the things I know that existed in Iraq when we walked around was mobile electronic warfare countermeasures or measures in this case, where you could create a bubble. This is for the audience. You create a bubble around your little patrol or maybe multiple bubbles where you could kill cell phone activity. And in this case, you would also be able to, to turn off drone capability. And so anything within that that circle would make that drone, it wouldn't communicate and hopefully would scramble back home to its uh, mothership or whatever. But there are, there are so many new threats now. And I would say in a lot of ways, war and conflict has been democratized. You, know, you and I can go spend a thousand bucks on, on uh, Amazon right now and buy an incredible drone that we could weaponize in an instant should we choose to. And they, people are doing that. You know, I mean, there's, there's, um, there's drones that fire 1,000 plus uh, seeds per minute into the ground for planting forests and everything, right? And so these things, if it can push seeds, it can push something that doesn't feel good. And so there are so many things. Do you see a world where, where like in your line of work, there is a guy with a backpack with, with EWO on his back and, and you're trying to do, it's not hard to fly a drone into a stadium. I've seen it several times. You, yeah. And the person doesn't care about the consequences because you can just do it. No, I mean, so on all those fronts, there's a lot to talk about, uh, you know, for us to unpack, that would take forever. But I would say yeah. is technology helps you and hurts you both. Uh, mm. Medicine can help you. Medicine can hurt you. So drugs, right? Drugs, we know, kill people, but drugs also save people. So it's how you use them in, in what context you use them. And context mm. is really important in the world that I work in. Um, you know, you talk about drones in, in many different ways. Like you mentioned Iraq, we use them operating on an air bill and getting information in Mosul in areas that we couldn't go into. And we were using drones, right? And the smaller ones couldn't collect certain things, but it was enough and it wasn't as easily detected. And yeah. they didn't go after them the same way. So um, the other problem was too, at the time we were using Chinese drones. And now there's, uh, you know, with this particular group, they can no longer use those. They're not allowing them to use them because there's a back door for those drones. Sure. Do certain things. So um, we have had that issue in stadiums. Obviously, it's possible in arenas, but that's not where it's been. I would look to um, the drug cartels in Mexico in particular to see how they're weaponized because, you know, in war you have it, but also these guys that are fighting a different type of war, they're very... Um, 
ingenious in how they apply and utilize the resources in their environment. And if you look at the cartels, they weaponized many years ago drones, um, you know, and you can see it online. I, you know, it's not top secret. It's not uh, TSSEI stuff. It's, it's very simple, straightforward stuff. Um, so it's a problem. It's a problem for wow. us. People learning um, behaviors of crowds. It's a big problem. Um, our artists typically all have the same ideology. In fact, I can tell you 100% of our artists have the same ideology. And it's one perspective. Everybody must share in that perspective. If you deviate from that, you're canceled. That's the truth. So mm -hmm. with that, they are not pro-gun. They're, they're anti-gun by and large. And what ends up happening is they don't want you to do this. They don't want you to do that. And they don't understand the complexity of security, but they want you to protect them. But they don't know the job they hired you to do. Right. So we have a case in, in um, you know, not discussing who it was or the time sure. period. We had a case in um, Europe where we had a particular city where things were going on. There were a group of guys that were operating out of a neighborhood. And they were from that neighborhood into another country, France, and they were conducting activities in those countries and then coming back in a very, very, very nasty uh, situations were kind of unfolding. And I had guys with long guns backstage and around these artists who hated guns. Listen, our environment's changed. Our posture has to change. No, 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 no. You're, this is over the top. This is a knee-jerk reaction. Da, da, da. So, listen, guys, I sat down with the commissioner of the police and went through this. I sat down with a local military colonel. Right. Got the intel reports. I've sat down with the RSO from the State Department. I've gone through this with all these people. This is the proper posture for what's going on. Right. No, 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 no. They're, they're throwing a fit. They're staying uh, at this hotel, a nice hotel in the center of the city. And all of a sudden, there's a gunfight that's occurring, right, between the local police who are using these little nine millimeters and this terrorist organization who are using AKs. So it's right. not, not much of a fair fight. Also, the, the terrorists had a lot more training and experience. They're having a gunfight. I get a call directly from the artist. Hey, oh, my God, this is going on, blah, blah, having a panic attack. I say, relax, put this in front of your door, put that in front of your door, go in the bedroom, get in the tub. This thing is going to provide protection, blah, 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 blah. Talking through him, like what he can do and how he can deal with it. I'm going yeah. to do this shortly. This is what's going on. So cut to coming to the shows, and I'm showing him stuff. Look, you see the military guys walking around here? You see the military guys? Did you mm -hmm. ever see those guys in this country before? No. That's an indicator. They're, they're, they're upping their posture because of what's going on. Right. So cut to... All of these guys on the crew uh, have the same ideology as the artist. And they're saying, I don't think you need to do that. That's unnecessary. All of a sudden, like, well, wait a second, maybe we need that. The yeah. next day, we're leaving, we're flying out. We fly out, we fly out on American Airlines at 10 o'clock in the morning. The next day, guess what happens at the American Airlines counter at 10 o'clock in the morning? Boom, suicide bomber, right? Yeah. All of them, like, oh, I'm sorry head down like, yeah, I, I, this is not a knee-jerk reaction. This is what we need for this environment. Now, the next show, that same artist who's anti-gun said, hey, what do you think about putting machine guns down in the barricade? <laughs> I said, hold, hold on a second. Aren't you anti-gun? Why would I do that? And then I'm trying to explain to them the other side of it. Like, first of all, we can't indiscriminately fire. Two, that weapon's not appropriate for that environment. There's 20,000 right. people in this room. It doesn't work that way. This is what we need to do. So yeah. everything is related to context and how you see the problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's true. What's going on here? Are we stuck? Something was stuck. Well, I don't know. All right. Well, we have a we have a stuck internet. I'm not sure if it's me or if it's him, but I'm going to assume that it's him because I seem to be working. So here's what I'm going to do. Hey, uh, everybody, this is Todd Fox. You can hear how qualified he is and, and what a fantastic mind he has for security and preparedness and all these things. And I love talking to these kind of folks because they're well, they're interesting and they have uh, interesting lives and it's always fun to talk to them. So if you guys uh, want to support the show, you know to go down to the uh, corner and subscribe. Or just go to the PayPal link at BreakItDownShow.com and put something in there each month. That'll help free me up and get me all around this country because if I have a little bit more money, I have a little bit more freedom. So that's what I'm asking for. I hope you guys all enjoy Todd. We'll have him on again soon. Everybody take care. Here come the credits.
Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly, 